go ahead and bow our heads for prayer. Father, we come before you so humble to be here. God, we are so grateful that you have given us ears to hear, eyes to see, and legs to move so that we can be here with you this morning. God, we are so thankful for your word and how it guides us, how it inspires us, how it gives us hope. And Lord, we are so grateful that you have given us a great message of salvation. I pray, God, that you open up our hearts wide this morning to receive it, to take it in, and to do something about it. Father, I pray that you move me aside, allow me to preach your word boldly without hindrance, with love, with compassion, and with truth. I pray, Lord, that you be with us this morning. We are so grateful for an awesome service already. We hope that you are encouraged and that you are smiling down upon us, Father, as we worship you this morning. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, I I have a question for us this morning. And uh, that question is, have you ever had a dream to do something great in your life? Have have you ever had a vision to do something great in your life? Amen. Amen. You know, I know what, for me personally, one of my all-time dreams and vision for my life as a child was to work with animals. I, I want, I want, I, if you ask my mom, I, I always had all these toys. I had all these dinosaurs. I used to like dinosaurs too. Um, I had all these animals that I would play with because I, I just loved God's creation. And I remember growing up as a boy, I watched all the TV shows. I watched all, you know, the, the Animal Planet series, the, the um, Crocodile Hunter, Animal, Animal Face, of all these crazy things I used to be into. And I watched those continuously in hopes that one day I would be able, be able to travel around the world and work with animals, to be a conservationist, to, to be a park ranger where I would fight off rangers who were trying to kill endangered species. But that was a big dream of mine. It was either a park ranger, a zoologist, or a vet. I just wanted to save animals. And sadly, I loved animals more than I loved people at the time. But I, I thought about that question, and, I, and if you're wondering, well, what happened, Aaron? Like, you, you are now an evangelist, you're in the ministry, you're leading a church. What happened to that dream of being a vet. What happened to that dream of being a zoologist? Well, I'll tell you what happened. My dream changed. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. Come on, Aaron. Come on, brother. You know, Matthew 28 is a, a scripture that we tend to look at a lot. And I believe sometimes as even the religious world gets desensitized to the sacrifice of Jesus, I believe that we can become desensitized to Matthew 28. Let's pick it up in verse 18. The Bible reads, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything, everything, amen, I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. When I first encountered this scripture, I didn't know that it was in the Bible. And I was shocked because I saw that as Jesus says his last words to his disciples before he ascends, he gives them this command, go and make disciples. And when when I made that decision for myself to become a disciple, I made that decision for Jesus' dream to now become my dream. And I'm not saying that if, if you don't become an evangelist or a women's ministry leader that this is it for you. No. But I'm just saying that I was so impacted by Jesus' dream that I wanted to change it and no longer wanted to become what I wanted to become, but what God wanted me to do and become for him. Amen. And I thought about this. I was like, well, what was Jesus' great vision for the world? It was the evangelization of this generation. And that's what we're about as a movement. We're about evangelizing the world in this generation. But you know what? I think that we can sometimes forget what that's all about. 
And I believe that we can get desensitized because being in a local congregation, sometimes you don't see the miracles that are happening in Africa. Sometimes you don't see the miracles that are happening in Sao Paulo. Sometimes you don't see the miracles that are happening in India. But we have to remember that what we're doing here as a local congregation is to complete Jesus' dream. But I had to ask myself, you know, what, what excites me about evangelizing the world in this generation? Well, one thing that excites me is that, man, I can't wait to see the world evangelized by God's moving hand. I can't wait to see the, the thousands upon thousands and even millions of disciples someday. I think about giving people hope that they wouldn't have if they weren't reached out to by a disciple. You know, what else excites me is all the different plant churches or all the church plantings that we will have. Because all of us have family all around the world and all across the states. And there's some states and some countries where there isn't a sold out church teaching sound doctrine. And I know for me, I want my family to be saved. And I want your family to be saved. And I think if we remember that, we will hold this scripture dear to our heart. But when you have a dream and when you have a vision, you tend to do whatever it takes for that to be accomplished. And, so, and that, that today is what I want to talk about. I want to talk about what does it take to evangelize the world in this generation. And so today's sermon is entitled, Do what it takes amen Amen. point number one keep to the vision you see if you're going to do what it takes you got to keep to the vision let's turn our bibles to acts chapter four i want to look at some examples to give us some hope to give us some faith of what propelled the first century church to keep the vision that jesus gave them In Acts chapter 4, we'll pick it up in verse 1. It says, To the priests and the captain of the temple, guard and Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in the jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. What do we see here? We see that the message that Peter and John preached disturbed people. We have to understand, guys, if we're going to take the word of God to the ends of the world, you're going to disturb some people. Because it says that when Peter and them, they preached, they, they said they were greatly disturbed because of what they were teaching. Have, have you ever sat in a Bible study and someone was just so disturbed yeah. when you showed them, look, according to the Bible, you are not living like a disciple. Sure. According to the Bible, you are in the dark and not, into the, and not in the light. That disturbs people's souls. I'll never forget when I did the discipleship study and for the first time in my life saw, wow, I have not been living like a true disciple. Now, I identified as being a Christian. I I identified as being a follower. But according to what Jesus said in his words, it disturbed my soul. And I think a lot of us got to take up our preaching a little bit. I think a lot of us got to take up our teaching a little bit about what? What they were proclaiming, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I believe that if we take this into consideration this morning, we're going to disturb some people. But you got to be okay with disturbing some people. Because the message, it, it does two things to you. It disturbs the comfortable or it comforts the disturbed. That's what the message, that's what the word of God does to us. And what we learn from these apostles is that they were seized Because of what they were teaching. Well, let's keep going. Let's look at verse 5. It says, The next day, the rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Anias the high priest was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, 
the other men of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. But what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. What I love is... Peter and John, they preached, and when they preached, they got in trouble. Have you ever got in trouble for preaching the word? If you haven't, you're in trouble. Yeah. Amen? Because the Bible says that if you're preaching the word, if you're preaching Jesus, at some point, you will be in trouble. But what I love is that the scripture shows that in the midst of opposition, the church still grows. And, and that's what I want to present to us this morning, is that what opposition has been going against Metro Heights? Because if there's no opposition going on, then it makes sense why we can be slow at growing the church. So I, I want to call us this morning to have a heart that is willing to preach against the opposition. Because when they preached, there wasn't just one, two, Three people that came to Christ. It said, after that, their number grew to about 5,000. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I, when I look at the book of Acts and I see the multiplication and I see people becoming disciples about, you know, in Acts 2, 3,000 were baptized in that one day. We got to bring the first century church miracles into the 21st century. Amen. Amen. You guys okay this morning? If y'all going to be born, I'm going to be born too. If y'all want a born sermon, I'll give you a born sermon. This ain't no Catholic church, amen. Y'all can make some noise for the Lord. But if you just convicted, amen, it's okay. Be silent. It's okay. Just let me know. Maybe just do a little like, amen. Because the word of God isn't born. So let's wake up, amen. You know, I love this because... It shows that Peter and John were opposed by groups of people and individuals, right? It says that they were opposed by the priests, the Sadducees, the rulers, the elders, the scribes, the priest's family members, the captain of the temple. People were just after their lives for preaching about Jesus. And sometimes we, we, we go about our lives as disciples where no opposition even exists but yourself. The only opposition that's in your life is you from stopping you from preaching the word of God. But check it out. It says in verse 8, it says that they, that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. Has there been times when the Holy Spirit just took over and you just said some things you needed to say to somebody? When the Holy Spirit just gave you that double dose of boldness? You know, I remember uh, a time where <laughs> I had to pray a lot for the Holy Spirit to give me some boldness. But I remember when I first became a disciple, I was attending Fullerton College playing football. And uh, I took, for, uh, for my first time, a speech class. Because it was, you know, it was one of those classes, those courses you had to take. And, and, I, and it was a persuasive speech. So the Holy Spirit put it on my heart. I was like, I need to, I need to do something about the Bible, about God. I, I want to, like, try to make some disciples in my class right here. So what I did is I put a, a persuasive speech together about why Jesus was the Son of God. So I added, you know, the Bible, I added empirical evidence, I was reading this book, I, I had my arguments, I had my counter arguments, and I was ready to go. 
I was like, ooh, someone's about to become a disciple today. And so I prayed because I was terrified. I was like, man, I don't want people to think I'm weird, that I'm this Jesus freak. And, you know, I prayed and I prayed. And, and you know when you get up there and the Spirit just takes over and you're just like, I don't even care what you think right now. You're going to hear the word of God today. And so I prayed and I prayed and I got up there and, man, it was like I was preaching. But it was in speech format. I had my, you know, had my outline, had my, my arguments and everything like that. And at the end of it, you know, there, there was a couple of people that came up to me and just, just were interested in what I talked about. And they, they didn't believe in the Bible. They didn't believe in any of those things. But I saw that, man, in my, in my fear and in, in, in me being timid to preach the word, I had some people come up to me and wanted to talk about it. But then I also had some people who opposed me. I had some people that didn't agree with some of the things that I said in my speech. But I was okay, because I, I felt equipped. I was like, look, I've been studying this all month. Come at me. You want some of this? Come at me. God got me. And, and, and there was some opposition there. But I want to encourage us this morning that I want you to create some opposition in your life with the word of God. I, I want you to pray for God to give you the boldness to do something radical for Jesus. Because if you don't do something radical, guess what? You're going to conform to your environment. Yeah. That's what we see the one thing that the apostles didn't do. They didn't conform to the priests, to the scribes, to the elders, to the high priest family. They, they were like, we don't care what you are saying. We know the truth, and we're going to preach the truth to you. You know, but I had to ask myself when I read this scripture, I was like, where's that young Christian at? Eight years ago. Where is he at today? When was the last time I did something bold like that for Jesus? And you know, when you sit back and it, it takes you a little bit to think, and you're like, oh, this is taking me quite a long time to think about. And, and it was convicting because I was challenged by this. That meant I got I to gotta stir up some trouble for the Lord. Now, some righteous trouble, amen? Don't be going up to people and just pointing and say, you lost, you're going to hell. Don't be doing all that. That's not what I'm saying. Don't do that. That would be very ignorant to do. Amen. Love the person. Amen. But do something bold because when you do something bold, you, you, you just feel a little loose for the Lord. You feel a little bit more powerful for the Lord. You feel a little bit more confident. And I want us to have this heart and this spirit that Peter and John had. But you know, the next thing that he says in verse 12, it says, salvation is found in no one else. That's a bold statement. He said, guess what? Salvation is only found through Jesus Christ. You know, and I find that on campus, you know, when you, when you talk about Jesus and you say you're a Christian, they already know that you believe this. Like, oh, you're trying to say that, that I have to believe in Jesus to get to heaven. Yep, that's exactly it. Let's, let's study the Bible and see why. And I, and I find that most people don't know why salvation isn't found in Jesus. But I think sometimes as disciples, we can, de we can devalue this statement yeah. that salvation is found in no one else. Yeah. That when you study the Bible with people and they, and they don't want to become disciples, you're kind of like, oh, hey, man. Like, uh, uh, I hope they come back. And, and we, we ourselves start to devalue this truth of how significant this means, how, how, how important this is. That this person that doesn't want to believe in Jesus and become a disciple is lost and is going to go to hell. That was the kind of vision that Jesus gave these apostles. Yeah. You know, I remember when I, when I, for the first time, saw how the world was lost. I remember I was studying the Bible, and uh, Raul Moreno uh, uh, counted the cost and, and did some improvised study with me because I was being prideful. And I, I never will forget that study where he helped me to see the truth of the scriptures and where I was at spiritually. But not only where I was at spiritually, but where my family was at and where the world was at. And I remember I, I, th this sense of ownership, this sense of responsibility, this sense of even excitement to be like, wow, this is what I've been missing in my life. Yeah. The excitement of wanting to help people. Right. Because before, I didn't have that type of heart for people. And God, at that very moment, changed me and said, if I'm trying to help animals, how much more should I help people's souls get to heaven and spend eternity with Jesus? 
But let's jump in and look at verse 29. Let's look at what happens at the opposition. It says, now, Lord, consider the threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. We got to pray prayers like this, church. We got to pray that when we do get uh, opposed and there is opposition, that we're going to be like, God, hey, consider those people's threats. Consider those people who are saying that, hey, you're part of a cult. Hey, consider those threats that people are saying, you guys are crazy. You can't evangelize the world in this generation. God, hear their threats and move in a powerful way so that people can see the miraculous things. But... We got to understand that sometimes when you're opposed, you tend to conform if you don't have these convictions. Let's look at this. Go to, come with me to Galatians chapter 2. Come on, Eric. In Galatians chapter 2, let's pick it up in verse 11. It says, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. Because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Paul right here says that he opposed Peter. The very man that we just saw preaching the word without hindrance and with boldness. But what what happened to Peter? He got tired of being opposed. He started to conform to the opposition. And what we have to understand is the Jews, some of the Jews that became disciples, started teaching Gentiles that, hey, you have to become a Jew first before you become a Christian. You actually have to do and participate in the Mosaic law before you become a Christian. That was false. And so Paul right here, he comes to him and he says, I opposed him to his face. Now, check this out. This happened between Acts 13 and 14, or 13 and 15. That was the year around 48 AD approximately. Now, Peter would have started following Jesus around 27 AD. And so Peter would have been around 21 years in the faith when he got opposed by Paul. See, it doesn't matter how old you are as a Christian. You can still conform to the world if you don't have deep convictions about the Bible. I want to challenge us this morning to write out some convictions that you have gotten weakened in. Write out some convictions that you feel like, man, I've been a little weak sauce in this area. And if you have, make the decision to make those convictions strong. Amen? Point number two, get the gospel everywhere. Get the gospel everywhere. Acts chapter 5. In Acts chapter 5, verse 39, the Bible reads, But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles and had them flogged. Then they ordered them to not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from, the house, to, from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Right here, again, the apostles are in trouble. They're in trouble because they're preaching the word. And the Sanhedrin grabs them again and throws them into prison. And Gamaliel stands on up and he says, you know what? Hey, guys, if what they're teaching is true and it's from God, you're not going to be able to stop them. Because you can't stop what God is trying to do. Amen. And so right here, he says, okay, let's let them go. And let's see what happens. But what do they do? They flog them. 
Now, I found that the word flogged, another word for that in Greek means skinned. So that they, they were whipped so much, their bodies were skinned. But look at the response. It says that they counted themselves worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Whose name? Jesus' name. And I, I, I thought about this. I was like, wow, I don't know about you, but I'm not skinned. And I know you guys aren't skinned. But where are the miracles? Where are the Bible studies? Where, where, where is the preaching? Where is the teaching at? Because even though they were whipped, they still went out and preached. We had to ask ourselves the question, what, what, what would we do if that happened to us? Would well, some of us been like, oh, I can't be a disciple no more. I'm out. Sorry, Jesus. I really didn't count the cost. If some of us were in that situation and got whipped, would you have been crying and, and just went into to your house and just hid away and didn't say anything anymore about Jesus? You know, I, I put before you that times are changing. You know, in, in, the West, in the Western side of the world, we have the privilege of being able to preach the word without anybody doing anything to you but saying no. But hey, there might be a day where that isn't the case anymore in the United States. There might be a day where it, they say you can't preach the Bible or you're going to go to jail, which in some parts of the world, that's the case. Would you still open up your Bible? Would you still preach? Because this is the heart of the apostles, that they weren't going to let anything stop them from preaching God's word. You see, the only way to stop Christianity is if you don't say anything. See, the, the, the way that Christianity would have stopped in the first century would have been if the apostles stopped talking about Jesus. But we got to ask ourselves the question this morning, what am I willing to go through to preach the word? You know, Martin Luther King once said, there is a time when silence is betrayal. Have you been betraying Jesus this week? Has there been some betrayal in your relationship with God this week by being silent? And I look, I was like, man, our, our church needs to grow in this area. Our church needs to be fired up to go out there and show Jesus how much we love him by saying something. Yeah. I want to give us a challenge. And this is a challenge that our leader Kip gave us uh, on Tuesday. And, you know, when, you, when you're given a challenge and you go and you're sharing your faith, you kind of forget about that challenge a little bit. That kind of happened to me this week. Kip gave this challenge that he said, if anyone intimidates you, share with them. And I remember I, I, this week I was sharing my faith, and there was like a couple people that I was like intimidated by. And I was like, oh, you know, you know, you start to make excuses and, and kind of rationalize. Well, he's, he's on his computer, you know, he's working. He's on the, he's on the phone. I don't want to be rude. You know, and, and you know that, that, that moment when you're like, you're about to like, oh, it's okay. I'm going to go get this guy. But then the, the Holy Spirit just convicts you right there. I was like, and I, I remember I was like, oh, wait, Kip gave us that challenge that if anyone intimidates you or a situation intimidates you, go share your faith. So I said, praise God. And I went over there and I shared my faith. Amen. But I want to give us that challenge, too. I want to give us that challenge to share your faith with anybody that intimidates you. And, and I also want to give us a challenge, as I gave earlier in the announcements, that as our Bring Your Neighbor Day service comes up on November 3rd, to bring out the most people that you've ever brought out before. So if you've brought out 10 people to church before, it's time to bring out 11. If you brought out five people to church before, it's time to bring out six. And if you brought out one church person to church before, it's time to bring a couple more, amen? But I want to give us that challenge so that we can glorify God on our Bring Your Neighbor Day service. Amen? In closing, let's go to John chapter 15. In John chapter 15, let's take a look at verse 8. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples. 
You know, Jesus right here, he says, how to bring him glory? By what? Bearing much fruit. Bearing that fruit of love, bearing the fruits of the spirit, but also bearing the fruits of making disciples. Because he says that will bring, you, that will bring him glory. But even in, in, in this chapter, Jesus talks a lot about remaining in him. And I find that when you remain in Christ and you continue to grow in Christ, then you're going to have a heart to seek and save the lost just as Jesus did. And I put before you this morning that if your heart isn't there to seek and save the lost, to keep that vision and to get the gospel everywhere, then it shows that you have yet to remain in Jesus. Because the Bible shows that when you remain in Jesus that you're going to bear much fruit in your life. And I want to challenge us this morning to remember that, hey, our, our objective, our mission is to evangelize the world in this generation. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm, I'm excited for the future to see where the movement is going because the movement is going, amen? And I can't wait to see all the churches planted around the world. I can't wait to see all the the souls that are going to come to God, even from the political world, even from the the athletic world, from the professional world. I can't wait to see prominent people raise up from that watery grave after they had just said Jesus was Lord of their life. I can't wait to see the brokenhearted people from around all nations have hope for the very first time in their life. But that will not happen if we don't keep the vision and that we don't do what it takes to make Jesus' dream our dream. So this morning, guys, I want to challenge us to really live out Jesus' dream. And if it's not your dream, to make it your dream and bring God some glory. Amen. To God be the glory.